Thank you very much, Karen. You know, as I, as I uh, prepare for Sundays, one of the things that always never ceases to amaze me is how sometimes people kind of steal the sermon before I can preach it. <laughs> uh, Karen kind of landed that one. So thank you, Karen. That was great. Um, for those of you that are dialing in and didn't get to enjoy her uh, communion meditation, the sermon will have to do. Um, I love sailing. I'm such a geek for it. Um, it it is, was always one of my joys living on the West Coast, and moving here has challenged me to find different ways to enjoy being in nature. Um, sailing is fabulous because it's filled with joy and challenge and excitement and thrill, skill, luck, and intuition. Um, and if you're an avid save sailor, you will inevitably face a storm. It's not if, it's when. And as wild as the wind and the waves can be, the largest threat in a storm isn't the wind and waves. It's a lack of peace. It's panic. It's the mind and life that succumbs to fear and tension, doubt, worry, and chaos. And life's no different. I mean, facing storms isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when your life has a storm. And in the storms, whether they're literal or figurative, you need to know how to keep your head about you. You need peace. Or you'll find yourself drowning. And ultimately, you will lose yourself to the chaos. One of the secrets of that is knowing what we set our sights on, what we focus on. That influences and determines our outcome. At Advent, we prepare to celebrate the coming of Christ by focusing on hope, love, joy, and peace. These are, these are axioms, they're anchors, pins around which we can revolve that help us keep focus. And today we discuss peace. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom, and it's a very important biblical concept. Um, it permeates the Bible. It means wholeness, health, freedom, correctness, and truth. Having shalom, having peace, means having centeredness that is bigger than what's happening around you. The New Testament refers to this peace as the peace that passes understanding, as Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Um, it, it's not the peace that lacks understanding, the way some people think, like, oh, it's the peace that passes understanding. I don't have to understand this. I don't have to try. I just have peace. No, that's not what it's saying. It's actually, it's, it's not saying the peace that lacks understanding. It's saying it's the peace that grasps and wrestles to understand, and yet somehow the peace is bigger than what, sh it sh what we're looking at that should cause it. It is bigger than our circumstances. It is a peace that is uh, an inner calm and clarity that despite our external circumstances abides. It's an untroubled mind that's aware of the conflicts, aware of the tensions, aware of the problems, and without flinching proceeds, continues to do what is best, what is right. It's a mind and a heart that are able to focus in the midst of the storm. It doesn't ignore the problems, uh, nor is it free of conflict, worries, struggles, or challenges. It recognizing them and comes to a place where what is pulling us onward is more weighty and significant than the things that hold us back. That's the underpinnings of the Hebrew word for shalom. I have this weighty peace that drags me forward into hope and love and truth. You know, um, what we set our sights on, what we focus on, influences our response. What challenges, in, what challenges the storm of life to peace? Well, let's look inside at the biblical text. We're going to look at the story of Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. Uh, so join with me in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Um, I've got it on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. Joseph was a man who had earned the nickname, The Just. In the sense of a man that deals redemptively with everything, he was very right, 
He was very righteous, a very good man. He wasn't a hard man, and he isn't some kind of pushover. He was a peacemaker. He was a person that worked hard to bring God into every situation and worked hard to make sure that things were the way God had intended them, which is the the Eastern notion of justice. He wasn't a legalist. He was thoroughly kind, but committed to doing things rightly. Joseph the just. And so what we see here as we read it, it says, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. And then they wind the clock back almost nine months. When, Jesus, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Jesus, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. See, what we see, that he was betrothed, which is an old-fashioned word for engaged. Uh, but it was a little different because in the eyes of the law at that time, it meant that he was already married. He was already, he was already responsible. He was already on the hook f- for marriage in the fullness of its responsibilities, but none of its privileges yet, if you know what I'm saying. So in principle, but waiting for the fulfillment. And if you go back to our sermon on hope from a couple weeks back, this, this concept of in principle, but not in fullness is, again, something that recurs over and over in the Jewish way of thinking. Um, It was why he was referred to her husband already. She was betrothed to Joseph, and her husband Joseph, not her fiancé, not her BFF, her husband. So the concept of already but not yet that permeates their culture also permeates the Christian message. Joseph was already in. And... Mary was found to be pregnant. Now, we know, like Joseph, that the baby wasn't his, right? Like, it is, that's kind of a no-brainer. But what did everyone else think? What did the neighbors have to say about this? Joseph the just, was he taking advantage of a situation? Was it someone else's? Was Joseph getting married to a questionable person? Maybe she's not as good as she seems to be. What would you do in the situation of Joseph? If you were Joseph and you're engaged to be married, you're on the hook, the bills are paid, everything's going to happen, we're just waiting for everyone to show up at the party, and all of a sudden this comes out. That it looks like your significant other cheated on you. How would you respond? One of the oldest Christian practices of discipleship is to read the Bible text, identify ourselves with one of the characters, and find ourselves in that story. Where our lives and these texts overlap allow us to find ourselves as part of God's story and tune our ears to what he might be saying to you. So would you expose, if you were Joseph, would you expose Mary? Would you ask her for an explanation? Would you try to protect her, or would you try to protect yourself? Or would you just kind of bury it and ignore it and just hope it goes away? Confront her, yell, find a way to hurt her back. Because Joseph was surely hurt by this. You see, Joseph was fully in his rights to demand her death, to expose her, divorce her, and have her face the law where she either be killed or ostracized and put outside of Jewish society and prote- protection. And, and no one would have faulted him for this. But that wasn't Joseph. Joseph was just, not punitive. So what was he to do? This, this is the storm that's raging inside Joseph where he's this person I'm supposed to trust and I'm, what am I supposed to do with that when I have evidence that something's not right here, when I've committed my life to doing things rightly? The condition of our heart and the reason for our actions compel examination. And maybe you want to believe that you do what he did. And maybe you really are more like him than other people and would do what he did. But the reality is quite simple. Joseph puts most of us to shame. It says he resolved to divorce her quietly. Have you ever stopped to ask why? Why did Joseph decide to divorce her quietly? What separates him? What makes him so good and kind and so trustworthy? 
Well, first, Joseph was a man steeped in grace. And I have to say that most of the time when we show grace, it's because we've encountered our own need for grace, my own need for, for that, that generosity and kindness. Most legalists and moralists may have started with grace, but tragically have become so concerned with doing the right, the proper thing, the impressive thing, the trying to please God, trying to please uh, others, trying to make things right, that they lose touch with taking the loving and redemptive approach. And so correctness replaces growth. Truth forces out love. Law replaces grace. Rules replace freedom. And letter overrides spirit. So don't misunderstand me, please. I love moral excellence. It's one of the greatest fruits and gifts that I can give God. But I think it's time that we need to see that to being committed to being right is often a wellspring of of problems. We all know that person who's so invested in being right that they become insufferable and hurtful to others, often without them even knowing it. They become blind. And this this is part of the warning that that Amos cautions people about. And he says, you guys have all the right behaviors down, if I can paraphrase Amos a little bit. He says, but the problem is, you're not actually creating, you're not bringing me into the situation. And so he says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteous like an ever-flowing stream. You know, I'm confident that Joseph was a thorough student of the prophets, and this message was not beyond him. He understood himself. And he understood people well enough to know that judge, justice, and mercy can kiss. Psalm 85, one of my favorite psalms. And what kind of response people are likely to offer. So Joseph the just deserves his nickname. It says, and her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Was it to save face? Was it to keep himself from embarrassment? I would posit that it's because Joseph wanted to protect Mary. The offended party wanted to help the offender, or at least perceptively, that's what it looked like. So when Joseph was faced with disappointment, Joseph chose grace. Choose grace. What choices can you make to spare shame on someone in your life? Shame in our culture rarely produces the kind of fruit that it's supposed to. It doesn't give us the results we're looking for. We get to come to conflict with kindness. We get to. Because I think we all know the harsh tr- that harsh, how harsh truth can be without love. Truth and love belong together. In what way can you make justice and mercy be manifest in your behavior? in how you talk to your kids, or your spouse, or your neighbor, or your co-workers. Second, Joseph chose humility. While he was figuring out how to go about this, he slept on it. You'll notice, as we go back to our text, it says he, he resolved to divorce her quietly. And then the next line says, as he considered these things... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. While he was figuring it out, or sorry, while he had figured out what he was going to do, the decision. He was figuring out how to go about it. Joseph chose humility in that he stopped and he meditated and thought, if this is the decision I've made, how can I go about this that doesn't ruin things, doesn't ruin her, doesn't ruin everything? 
So he was trying to figure out, how do I put this into action, this thought into action? So it isn't that he hadn't made up his mind. He had made up his mind. He was trying to figure out how to act on it. The process of walking it out is what he's in the path of. And so he, at one of the, as he's rolling this around his head and trying to figure out what's the best way to deal with this, uh, this is when the angel arrived in a dream and contradicted his plan. How many of you have made a decision and after you've decided, got new information that made you rethink your decision? There are a large number of people that make a decision that don't stop to critically assess their decision. They don't stop and think about what is the outplay of this, what is the consequences, where is this going to go for them and for me. And so they tend, to, they tend to just, they make the decision and they run quickly to implementation. Wisdom and humility says, slow down. If you've, once you've made your decision, let's sit on it for a little bit. Not a long time necessarily, but just enough time to think about how to do this right and to second guess what we're doing, to be sure. And so Joseph recognized that a good decision might not be good enough because the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Thing. I'm going to say that again because it's very important. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. For Now, if you're like my kids at home that are watching this, candy canes are awesome, not five minutes before bedtime. <laughs> right? Mom and dad kissing each other is great. Probably not in front of your kids when you're dropping them off at school. They tend to make funny faces and go, Ugh. right? Time and a place. But the right thing, candy, love, affection, are the right thing. But if you do them at the wrong time, they become the wrong thing. I've learned not to turn left on a red light. It's <laughs> right? And that's one of the funny things about it, because we think that this is the right thing to do. Well, given context, context is so important. And so Joseph recognized that his own thoughts, his own way of looking at this was limited. And so the beginning of wisdom is accepting a different way of seeing it that may challenge our perception of the right time or manner. So when faced with a hard decision, Joseph chose humility to be receptive. And so this is what he heard in those words. We hear, the, don't be afraid, Joseph. Don't be afraid to do this. This is what he heard. God's promise God's kingdom, God's purposes, God's justice is being fulfilled through your marriage to Mary. The healing of the world's problems, the creation of real peace, the path for everyone to having that ability to rest your head at night with no worries. That centered calm, that silence of heart and mind. God was saying, I'm going to do that through your marriage to Mary. Why would you not take that, Joseph? And so the angel didn't use the word peace. It didn't. It gave the substance of peace. It gave him something far more weighty and significant than the storm that was in him. It spoke to that storm of troubles and fears and loss of honor and doubt and pain and betrayal. And its proclamation was potent. If we look over, uh, it, it says, All these things took place to fulfill what the Lord had said. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. Peace. Peace will come. Peace will be here. It will live with us. And so the proclamation of the angels, which you see in Luke, they said to the shepherds, Don't fear, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you, that you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, this is not an exceptionally unusual description of a baby being born at that time. What's unusual is that the King of glory, the God of the universe, the, the coming King, the Savior, the one that deserves every honor that belongs in a palace, the one that reigns supreme, is born in the hood 
laid where I was laid. He's, it's not that he's in some strange birthplace. It's that he's in a birthplace that I can go to. The way to God is right here. That's what makes it so astounding. And so the angels burst into praise. Glory to God in the highest and peace to, on earth among those with whom he is pleased or on peace on earth to, and goodwill towards men. See, when you can let go of your illusion of rightness, when you can recognize that you can't see everything, you can acknowledge that there is a greater wisdom than yours and that it doesn't originate with you, and that the sweet freedom to be wrong or to change your mind or to respond differently than you usually do, that, that it's open to you brings so much. Joseph grasped this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. So when Joseph woke up from his dream, he did as the Lord commanded him. He took the wife and didn't know her until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So when faced with uncertainty, Joseph chose trust. He knew he was being directed to shelter from that storm of misplaced affection and ego and a skewed sense of justice that had more to do with punishment than who God is. He knew that the storm wasn't about him, but was for the benefit of others. And God had a bigger purpose in the storm than he could see. What storm are you experiencing that God might have a bigger purpose for than you? What pain, what struggle, what storm are you facing that God is using and will use for the healing and wholeness of others? Because I am not going to lie, there is a cost. It may be your reputation, uh, people's respect or admiration for you. Joseph certainly knew the dashing of those things, the hopes of his success, of influence of a family. Mary would certainly never, never live this one down, and the text shows that. And if married to him, married to her, he would never live this down. Joseph chose to accept this. He chose to trust. And so the dilemma before him, God was saying, Joseph, do you trust me? And by extension, I would say that God is asking you, Do you trust me? Enough that if I interrupt your plan, your vision, your idea of what's going to happen, if I interrupt that in order to accomplish my purposes, are you still on board? Are you still going to stay with this? So resolved, Joseph arose and he knew peace. Was the doubt gone? No. Was the gossip gone? No. Were the fears and the complications made by the storm, were they gone? No. Nor would they go away easily. But he knew where to set his focus on the promise and character of God. And from there, he went back to Mary and chose to trust God by trusting her. Now, I don't think God picked Mary to be the mother of Jesus because of just Mary. I I, I think God chose Mary because he knew he could trust, trust Joseph to express his heart, train the child in that, and teach him the ways of God. So regardless of whatever feeds your storm, if your friends gossip or if your spouse speaks harshly to you, or if your family members act in ways that are hurtful or crazy, financial hardships may come and you may realize that you aren't as good or as right as you thought you were. Or maybe it's the crash of hopes and dreams and plans that you've had. A lot of people are feeling the pain of a canceled Christmas distanced from extended family. Regardless of how your storm, storm is composed, and regardless of its size, the unfailing focus, the fixed northern star, the harbor of peace in every storm, is Jesus. He is what draws us forward into hope, love, joy, and most of all, peace.
So this Christmas, as we prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus, let us tend to our sense of peace that comes from having a reliable focus, the peace that sees you through the storm. But to do that, it means making the choice to walk in grace, humility, and ultimately trust. The peace that passes understanding, a shalom. It's a, still, it's a silence that weathers and consumes the storm, a stillness born not from a lack of conflict, but born of a peace greater than a storm, a shalom, a wholeness, a peace for such a time as this.